Hello and welcome back to another video. Today's video, I wanted to just sit down and do something a little bit nicer, a little bit calmer and um, a little bit happy to see us through difficult times. And so what I want to talk about today is sort of the golden age that we are currently in of children's media. Now I personally really enjoy reading children's books, you know, in the uh, 8 to 12 sort of age range. I also really enjoy watching cartoons. I don't know whether it's because recently there's reason to be a lot more anxious and I find that sort of, you know, diving into these carefree, excitable, adventurous ro worlds helps to alleviate that anxiety or whether it's just I uh, embrace my inner child and find pleasure in sort of the colourful, the bright and the, um, the not so perilous. And I think if anything, the more I watch and the more I read, the more I see that these sort of uh, fictions, either on TV or in literature, are created also for adults. I think they speak a lot to adult experiences in ways that might go over the heads of the children, but um, can still be enjoyed by the adults that might be, you know, on the periphery and consuming this media at the same time. I think it's also really important to engage with and celebrate children's uh, media. And I, often tie and I often find that the fantasy from the children's media is so much more imaginative than the fantasy that we tend to get sort of that is muddied by the adult experience and the reality of the world around us. So I wanted to talk about this sort of golden age which I feel like we're in because we're getting so many brilliant cartoons out at the moment. We're getting, sh we're getting shows like Amphibia and Craig of the Creek and Clarence which are all such funny, silly shows, yet, you know, have really, uh, have a really good heart to them um, and, you know, tell really touching and beautiful stories. In the 8 to 12 section of children's books, we're seeing not only diverse stories, which we're not particularly getting in the adult realm, we're getting diverse, we're getting exciting and imaginative stories, we're also getting beautiful cover designs, which really help to make uh, a book that's, that, that, that's so much more special. Perhaps, uh, children's media has always been very geared up to uh, to suit its market, um, but I just feel like maybe in my awareness at least we're coming into an age, particularly in like from 2010 to 2020, where there's been some really really solid children's media productions. So I think in this vein, what I wanted to do in this video was uh, talk about some children's books that I've read and enjoyed and then talk about cartoons that kind of remind me of the books. So if you're looking for cartoons to watch based on children's books then this is your source or if you're looking for children's books to read based on cartoons then again this is your source. So the first one I wanted to talk about is a, a book called Pet by Akweke Mezi. This is a very touching, very beautiful um, story that Akweke Mezi has written with such compassion. It follows a trans main character as they come to terms with um, the utopia that they live in not quite being the utopia that they thought it was. As this strange presence makes itself known in their, our main character's life, our main character and their best friend kind of have to deal with the fact that um, there is evil out there and that they have to confront it and that simply pretending that it doesn't exist doesn't do any good for anyone. It's beautifully written and very carefully crafted um, and it really impressed me, much more than Akweke Mezi's debut novel um, Fresh Water did. So then the cartoon that always reminds me of that is uh, Steven Universe. Now Steven Universe is a story about the crystal gems. Steven is the son of a crystal gem and a, and a human uh, and therefore Steven has to take on the burden on his shoulders of being a crystal gem who are sort of these rebel forces um, that are defying this massive space like villain uh, community that are intent on harvesting the earth for its own gain. But I chose this one because Steven Universe deals with gender in a very beautiful way. All the crystal gems are genderless because they are gems, but they're all mostly female presenting. However, they have really fluid feminine identities that are oftentimes um, exploring masculine and feminine identities. Steven himself is a young boy, but he also kind of deals with a feminine identity having his mother's crystal within him, but also um, as a fusion with one of his best friends where they become a female presenting teenager, ultimately. There's so much compassion in Steven Universe and the stories, even though there are, isn't evil to be defeated, there's always hope and it deals with the fact that um, you can still find happiness despite evils and that you are allowed to feel negative emotions and experience things negatively and that, you know, the people who are surrounding you, your family and your friends um, are there to support you through it, which is very much the same message you get in Pet. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the themes and the tones of both of these pieces of media 
are truly beautiful and, you know, share great positivity. The next book I wanted to talk about was The Land of Raw by Jenny McLaughlin. Um, this book is a sort of fantasy adventure novel, kind of in the same vein as um, The Chronicles of Narnia. It's about a brother and sister who um, they had this imaginary world when they were much younger um, called Raw. And then as they go back to visit their grandpa, I believe, um, the grandpa gets sucked in between the sort of mattress. Um, and these two realise that Raw might actually be real. And they have to go in and they have to save their grandpa. Um, it's a very fun, exciting adventure. Um, and there's sort of like a very interesting evil character in it, which is quite unnerving. And ultimately the story that you get to live at the end is hopeful yet dark um, and it's a very interesting perspective on this sort of portal fantasy genre. So then the cartoon that kind of reminds me of this is Over the Garden Wall which was shown on Cartoon Network. It was just like a one mini series thing um, and it, it, it's perfect. It's, this cartoon is dark and it's creepy and it is also again in this sort of like uh, alternate reality perspective which has that feeling of a portal fantasy um, and it's not really explained until the end when the narrative comes to a head. There's two very endearing siblings with very different um, ideas um, that are kind of traveling through this world trying to find out how to get home I believe and it has a very gothic creepy vibe and that's kind of what reminds me of The Land of Raw is that the villain in Land of Raw very much reminds me of some characters that we get to see in Over the Garden Wall which freaked me out a little bit. <laughs> Even as an adult, I was like a little bit disturbed and a little bit scared by some of the characters. Um, just because they're so uncanny, there's a very like subversive darkness to it, um, which I think is also present in The Land of Raw. And even though they're both very suitable for children and they're funny and they're um, exciting, they do have like a dark undertone to them, which I think I really valued as an adult also. The next book is The Extremely Inconvenient Adventures of Bronte Metalstone by Jacqueline Moriarty. Now this book is a sort of another fantasy adventure book in which Bronte Metalstone, on, um, as, as according to her parents' wills who have just died, she has to travel to visit um, I think like 12 aunts or something um, across this sort of country and in each place a different sort of mini adventure happens which culminates in the end to a realization of um, her parents lives that she really didn't know anything about um, and coming to terms with who she is as a person who her family is and, and what she can gain from that and her friends so then the cartoon that kind of reminds me of this is uh, Carmen San Diego which I recently watched and very much enjoyed more so than I thought I would Carmen San Diego is I guess a little bit older it's a little bit more of a teenager cartoon um, but it follows Carmen San Diego, who was trained as a thief and now she only steals from the thieving sort of community that sort of raised her. In each episode she has to go to a different city um, all around our world and um, it's not very fantasy based, it's more like spy based. And so and there's always like a mini adventure happening in each city. She has a solid group of friends that she has kind of gathered around her which help her in her adventures. There is also a theme that kind of arcs the narrative of this series in which Carmen is kind of wanting to learn more about where she came from, who her real parents are, and how did the, the villain community sort of pick her up and raise her. Um, and therefore she, she wants to set out to learn about her past and who she is and who her family is. Um, therefore, you know, you can see the links there. Um, and they're both very exciting pieces of media and I, I enjoyed both of them very much. And then the next book is Storm Witch by Ellen Renner. Now this is a sort of a children's fantasy that's set on an island in which as soon as the um, children come of age of 13, I think, they have to undergo a ceremony in which they uh, dedicate their lives or something to one of the elemental gods that kind of dictates life on this island. Now, our main character called Storm, she's an orphan. I think her father died from by like the water spirit or by the water element and then her mother died by the earth element. And then when Storm goes to uh, their sort of choosing, the elemental spirits bestow upon her uh, a different kind of power which nobody on this island has seen before or knows about. And as such Storm is kind of a little bit ostracised and has to kind of win over uh, the island and kind of defeat the, the baddies that are coming to invade the island. This reminds me of uh, She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. I think that's the full title, but She-Ra. Because She-Ra is uh, sort of a, a character who has this power, the She-Ra power, um, 
without kind of really asking for it or wanting it and having to come to terms with how to use it. She-Ra is also surrounded by these princesses who are sort of like elemental powers. Um, they, they, have, they have these powers which they kind of help to fight the, the Horde, which is like the massive villain sort of body that is kind of attacking the planet in which uh, She-Ra and all the princesses live on. It's a very empowering storyline that kind of, you know, uh, really that deals a lot with that sense of being different and having to find friends or having to negotiate friendships with this feeling of being different and having like a greater burden upon you because of your own um, identity and power and stuff, which I felt like you kind of also get in Storm Witch. she is a brilliant cartoon and Storm Witch is also a brilliant book. So then another book that I, you know, cannot ignore because I enjoyed it so much is A Place Called Perfect by Helena Duggan. And this book is a sort of dystopia in which in, in a town called Perfect, um, there's something untoward is happening. There's a brainwashing going on by the two villains in which the town who drink tea um, are only seeing the world imperfect and, the, and the, anything that's not perfect becomes somewhat invisible and it kind of is used to control the the feeling of the town and to control the population so that people can't sort of rebel against it. Uh, and then of course the story is the main characters do rebel against it and reclaim their own autonomy within this context. The cartoon that I chose for this one is Gravity Falls. Now whilst Gravity Falls doesn't necessarily have like the same sort of dystopian feel to it, well, it, <laughs> saying that, there is an apocalyptic ending to Gravity Falls. But in Gravity Falls there are twins who are living in a place where weird things are happening and they're trying to make sense of these weird things and um, trying to understand the world around them in terms of like friendships, relationships and dealing with the uh, sort of darkness of the this um, other side that kind of wants to control the world ultimately. Um, so <laughs> Gravity Falls is just like hilarious. It's so strange yet so perfect. Um, Mabel is my favourite character in Gravity Falls. She's absolutely insane um, and is just hilarious with her pet pig. But I think more than anything, the sort of the, the imagery and the style of Gravity Falls very much reminds me of the style of A Place Called Perfect. They're a little bit darker, they're a little bit off kilter, they're a little bit uh, quirky yet fun at the same time. Um, and and so I always get that same feeling uh, when I read the book and when I watch that cartoon. And then lastly I wanted to talk about Nevermore, The Trials of Morrigan Crow by Jessica Townsend and Wondersmith is the sequel to Nevermore. So the whole Morrigan Crow series, I kind of even though we've got the first two books, um, is about Morrigan Crow who doesn't quite fit into her own world and then she's invited to the world of Nevermore where there is magic, there's all this sort of like adventurous fantasy world happening around her. Um, as you're trying to get into an academy where you learn how to use the magic dependent on your skill sets, but she doesn't have any powers. However, she always feels that she's been cursed from birth and that, you know, she was supposed to die on her 13th birthday and that's the day she was uh, taken to Nevermore. And as it turns out, she does have um, a particular power which is I guess seen as somewhat evil within the context of the magical world and therefore, you know, there's a lot of uh, tension about how she fits into this magical world. The, the cartoon that I want to talk about is Star vs. the Forces of Evil and I think this is probably one of my favourite cartoons ever. Star is a princess witch who has a wand that does the weirdest of magic. She's just like this uh, high energy girl who is kind of a tomboy but very much also a princess. She loves rainbows and she loves pretty things but her magic is actually really quite dark and she loves, you know, fighting monsters. There is a very interesting sort of examination of good and evil in this and that Star is, and as Star develops throughout the series, she comes to terms with good and evil not necessarily being um, black and white and that she kind of exists within a grey area. Um, and as the magic system gets explored more, there's so many interesting sort of philosophical ideas about the darkness of magic and uh, the power that Star possesses and whether, you know, she deserves to possess that power and stuff. So whilst it has the rainbow, fun, childish imagery that Nevermore also has, they both deal with this sort of dark, evil theme in which um, it really interrogates what it means to be bad uh, and how that is represented within young girls and how young girls can be so many different things at once um, without having to fit into any particular societal boxes, which I think is great that we're seeing more of and, I, and it always makes me happy. So that was a quite a lot of talking actually um, about children's media. 
Um, but it did make me very happy and nostalgic to talk about it. And I hope it gave a little smile to your face um, and maybe some ideas about things to read or watch in the future. So I'll see you soon for another video. Bye bye.